Hello and welcome to The Big Picture. One of the landmark legislations in this country which changed the nature of governance and brought in unprecedented transparency and accountability was the Right to Information Act passed during the UPA government in 2005. However, there are still certain areas where there is a debate about whether the RTI Act should be applicable or not. One such institution is the higher judiciary. As far back as 2010, the Central Information Commission on an application by a petitioner had ordered that all correspondence between the Collegium and the government about the appointment of the three Supreme Court judges should be disclosed under the RTI Act. However, this order was challenged by the Central, and Central Public Information Office of the Supreme Court after rejecting the request to the petitioner to disclose the information. Ever since the case has been pending in the Apex Court, yesterday the three-member bench which was dealing with the case has decided to refer the matter to a constitution bench. Incidentally, the Apex Court, which had initially resisted even disclosing the assets and liabilities of the judges, later decided to make voluntary disclosures on the court's website. So what are the pros and cons of disclosing the details of appointments to the higher judiciary? Will it bring more transparency and improve the process? Or will it lead to the process getting tainted or controversial? We will discuss this today with Soli Sorabji, former Attorney General of India, Satyananda Mishra, former Chief Information Commissioner, Anjali Bharadwaj, co-convener of National Campaign for People's Right to Information, Prof. Raj, C. Rajkumar, Vice Chancellor of O.P. Jindal University, and Satya Prakash, Legal Editor, Hindustan Times. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Mr. Mishra, in, under what circumstances did the uh, Information Commission decide that this is something which should be disclosed? You know, when this matter came up in an appeal before the CIC by an activist, Subhas Agrawal, so the CIC had no option because the law did not make any exception for the judiciary. Judiciary, including the Apex Court, are not exempted from the operation of the Right to so Information Act. So this 8IJ doesn't apply to this? Pardon? 8IJ of the RTI Act doesn't apply? No, no. 8, 8, 8, 8.1J does 8, apply, but that is not an, that is an exemption clause on, about personal information. Okay. But selection of judges or, or transfer of judges or complaint against judges, these are not personal matters. So, so, therefore, the CIC did not find that this information was covered under any of the exemptions. There is a section, section 24 of the Right to Information Act, which exempts certain institutions like Intelligence Bureau, RAW, CRPF, CISF like institutions from the operation of the Right to Information Act. Judiciary doesn't find place there. So, judiciary, like any other public authority in India, Supreme Court or High Courts, they are covered as much under the Right to Information Act as any other institution. So therefore, the CIC had no option but to hold that the appointments to the higher judiciary and the transfer of judges which are decided the, in the meetings of the collegium and then communicated to the government of India must be disclosed when demanded by a citizen. So, therefore, uh, this, this was the rationale for the CIC to pass that, that order. Okay. Mr. S Mr. Sorabji, Mr. Sorabji wh why is there resistance in the judiciary to disclose this information? Do you think that there are some valid grounds to it? I suppose the thinking is that if, it, if you disclose whatever transfer, they're supposed to say that Mr. X Mr. X, who is about to be elevated, whether he's incompetent or he's not good. Now, if you disclose that, that might damage the reputation of that person. Sir, in this so particular... The question is, you must disclose, but to what extent? Sir, in this particular... There must be a limit to disclosure. Sir, in this particular ca case, there were three... Sorry. The, sorry, uh, the, in this particular case, the petitioner had asked for specific information about three judges' appointment. So you think that, you know, if, if, if there are questions or applications related to specific judges, this is something which, which should be disclosed? But I think in the greater interest, it should be. Why not? There's no reason. There's no uh, question of any national interest being affected by it. I think sunlight is a good disinfectant. 
by large person is thinking, I think there should be disclosure under certain special circumstances there are reasons to not disclose certain matters. Otherwise, as a rule, there should be disclosure. That's my view. Okay, but you know, what are, what can be special circumstances be? Because as you, as you rightly, as you previously pointed out, that, you know, there may be some kind of a fishing expedition involved in this kind of, you know, uh, information which is sought, which can hurt others. So how do you, how do you, how do you ensure that it doesn't hurt people's reputation or things like that? Well, look, the question is, there's a risk involved. But on the whole, what do you do? Do you suppress that information? You don't give the information? What I meant is, suppose the discussion about a particular judge A, that he's lazy or he's not good or there's some other reason, these personal matters may not be disclosed. The reason he should be disclosed and the conclusion must be disclosed, but not the method by which they came to the conclusion, not the things they took into account, because that may cause unnecessary damage to that person who is not elevated, who will still be practicing at yes. the bar, and people will say, politicians will say, Arab, we don't want this fellow, <laughs> for him the collegium thought he was lazy, he was inefficient. So we have to draw the line somewhere. Now I think on the whole, I would say, disclose the reasoning, disclose the conclusions fully, but not every stand in the reasoning as to why you came to the conclusion. Okay. Anjali, is that, is, is, you know, what is, the, what is the principle behind seeking this kind of a disclosure? Uh, look, Girish, I think that uh, the judiciary has played a very significant role in having a right to information law in our country. And in fact, uh, they have championed the cause of this law. And this law is applicable to the judiciary, like Mr. Mishra said. Now, having said that, uh, there are certain concerns which can be discussed. But I think what is really important to bring up front is that there are certain set of exemptions in the right to information law. Section 8 of the law clearly lays down exemptions which includes personal information, the disclosure of which has nothing to do with public interest. It includes many other things, things which would harm national security and so on. Now, if there are specific instances of information about appointments which relate to personal information. So if, if let's say somebody has in, their, uh, in, the, in the process of appointment brought out to light something related to their medical condition and that is personal information, there is a clause in the Right to Information Act which talks about not disclosing that information. Also section 10 of the Right to Information Act deals with severability. So the government and the courts would have the right to redact certain information from the documents and give that information to people. Now, I think the whole discussion here and the point of concern is that the judiciary's independence might be hurt. Exactly. And, and would the judiciary, uh, the credibility of the judiciary be hurt? I think across the world, transparency regimes, the experience with right to information type laws have showed how institutions are in fact strengthened by transparency laws. The credibility, the public trust in institutions, which is waning across the board, unfortunately, and there are allegations of corruption against any number of public servants. It would only help if any institution comes under the right to information and discloses information. If there is a doubt in a citizen's mind that the process of appointment might not have been done in the correct way, if information is put in the public domain, it would only help rest those fears. So I think there's no harm. In fact, it would prevent any kind of political interference, any other kind of interference in the process of appointments if this information is in the public domain. Yes, yes, Mr. Mishra. You know, you, you asked uh, Mr. Sorabji about uh, this particular case which was brought to the CIC. In Mr. that case, if you recall, Justice A.P. Saha, the formerly Chief Justice of Delhi High Court, Justice A.K. Patnaik, they had been superseded. And, and Justice V.K. Gupta. V.K. Gupta and three other judges were appointed. Now, the question is, at that time, there was a, an outcry in the public and a lot of controversy had uh, arisen because Justice Saha's... Uh, uh, you know, supersession did not really, uh, did not jail with the public opinion about Justice Saha's conduct or his, his stature. So, it, shouldn't the public of India know that in what condition was he superseded? 
So, so, so therefore, since the judiciary itself wants that all other branches of the government, namely the, the state, namely the legislature and the executive should be completely transparent in their operations, this, why should judiciary be completely close to the public? I mean, we know nothing about. Supposing there is a complaint against a high court judge about his integrity, we just don't know what happened because the police doesn't inquire into it, CBI doesn't inquire in, into it, and if you ask the under RTI what happened to the complaint, then the judiciary, the Supreme Close Court the gives, gives the information. Rajkumar? Uh, well, I broadly agree with the contours of the fact that you know no institution including the judiciary can be exempted from the legal framework of the right to information. But in the context of judiciary, we need to recognize a couple of things. First, as opposed to any other institution, judiciary within our constitutional framework is vested with the power to interpret the constitution and legislation and all the scope of the exercise of powers of all other institutions. So in some sense, it's very important to recognize the distinction of any other institution as and opposed the, and to judiciary. judiciary. What is the scope and content and the uh, of the power that legislation and constitution and institutions are supposed to exercise? That's why probably it makes sense for the judiciary to have a constitutional branch to interpret as to what is the appropriate way by which this can be done. The second, which is a very important point, is that unlike other institutions, Judiciary as an institution is very awkwardly positioned as far as defending itself. It is, it is not expected among the judges for them to defend themselves even when allegations are made. As opposed to... Unlike the other two... Unlike other institutions. So in a way, as much as we need to be very conscious of the fact that judiciary, in what happens in all these matters, whether complaints against judges or appointment process, all these need to be transparent we need to recognize that there is something uniquely different about the judiciary simply because they just cannot defend themselves like any other uh, you know, power holders in our scheme. Because of that unique distinction, the nature and context of the disclosures also need to be what, I, I mean, that's why Mr. Sorabji probably alluded to the fact that there has to be a determination of the scope of disclosure. For example, think about another scenario where some allegations are made it's out in the public domain and the person gets appointed regardless. But this, the fact that these allegations are made in the public domain and still appointment went through, people could still think, oh, you know, this person might have managed and still got it or the other way around. In a way, it is so easy in our public domain today to make allegations against people. And that is also why we need to be cautious as to how the nature of the disclosure... The, the scope is itself is, is very important. Uh, Sati Prakash, Sati Prakash, what are the what what is it that the judiciary, the higher judiciary, the judges, what are their concerns? Well, it's more about their mindset than the provisions of the RTI or anything else, and the concerns uh, Professor Raj has raised. It's more about their mindset. They are comfortable in opacity, and they are not uh, ready to open up as an institution. It is not just in this case. There are several other Despite examples. the fact that they have, they have been forcing other, other institutions to, work, uh, to open up. Uh, well, uh, that's the real problem. They want everybody or every other institution to open up. But so far as their own conduct is concerned, they don't want anybody else to know about their own. In this case, this related to the supersession of very senior uh, judge and that to a reputed judge and people really wanted to know why this judge has been superseded and that should have been disclosed. But again I am saying this is more about their mindset and less about the provisions of the RTI Act or so called independence of judiciary because this term is being used now and then for everything they will say that independence of judiciary is in danger. That is to be Indian judiciary is too robust and that its independence is going to be threatened. In a democratic country at this stage, the India as a democracy, we have moved so far and so ahead that independence of judiciary is not going to be threatened. They should have this confidence and open up as an institution because this law, if they open up and disclose all such information, it will enhance their credibility as an institution and also people will start respecting them much more. Than but do you government. agree? But but the the question is of scope as. Uh, as Professor Rajkumar points out, where do you start? How much do you disclose? At what point do you disclose? All these things are issues which needs to be taken into consideration. I'll, let me get Mr. Surabji. Mr. Surabji, 
the scope you you spoke, spoke about the scope now in the case of this the application which was filed to disclose about why these three judges were superseded and why three other judges were appointed two of them went on to become the chief justices of of the of india you know the question is at what stage do you disclose this are are you disclosing this as the collegium is taking the decision or is it take is, are, are these information to be disclosed after the decision is taken you know and and what are the consequences of that you know we must decide what information is to be disclosed right if as i said why they were not superseded or not appointed well disclose the reasoning but not every material you used in the reasoning so there must be some limit to it to say the judiciary does it for other institution but judiciary is an institution different from others as rajkumar proper, uh, properly pointed out so the question is you have to draw the line of course this grows but will you discuss whatever transfer between the judges what was they said to each other what was explained how does that increase the credibility of the judiciary so what i say is there should be a limit the scope of disclosure and a limit your reasons for doing a certain act please say it and your conclusion based on the reasoning but not everything that went into the uh, process of reasoning which led to the conclusion that will be rather embarrassing to the person who is not finally appointed and vice versa mr mishra would you agree with that no. what is the who decides the scope you know the, is the does the act have existing act does it decide the scope yeah uh, normally the the laws passed by the parliament are equally applicable to all citizens of india all institutions of india the law itself has a sufficient uh, safeguard safeguard the safe, the safeguards are to be interpreted by the public information officer of the supreme court as much as it will be done by the rashtrapati bhavan or the pmo or the or any other office when the inform in this particular case when the information was being sought by subhas agrawal somebody in the supreme court should have found out which part of that information should be given or not given but i am on a larger issue in 2010 the cic passed the order under the rti act cic is the highest appellate authority right. its orders are not appealable only a writ petition can be filed against that and a writ petition was filed by the supreme court the supreme court being the highest court just stayed that order it took 6 years for the supreme court to form a three judge bench now uh, a five judge bench has been con- uh, is to be constituted god knows how many more years to go so what impression goes to the public that rti act is something because supreme court has the power to stay so it can just simply stay it and not give that information what is the meaning of the information now for mr subhas agrawal so it first start it first started with a two ju- two ju- member judge. bench and then a three member bench, bench and, and now it's I, gone to the constitution and, and secondly imagine J- justice patnaik who had been superseded that year along with justice saha and justice gupta was appointed as a supreme court judge next year so the that means the year before he was not fit the year later he was fit so the citizens of india have a right to know that what factors broad factors were responsible for his superseding and you know that is where the problem lies yeah. mr mishra the question is that what is this broad factors who will decide what is the this, does, what are the broad factors no the court the the public and and incidentally the, the communication between the government and the collegium yes you you say need also needs to be discussed yeah of course see the communication between any two public authorities government is a public authority law ministry is a public authority with which the supreme court would be corresponding or department of justice so between two public authorities the the communication is completely disclosable subject to the provisions of the exemptions given in the right to information act this information officer of the supreme court could exercise his uh, discretion to find out which part of this information Anj- as anjali ji said should be taken out and which information should be given there was to no say, such attempts made with no attempt i mean it was a blanket it was a blanket denial of information for 6 years the supreme court stays the order now god no jeep subhas agrawal is alive he might see the end of the day and uh, some, some he might get some information but supposing at the end of this entire protracted litigation the supreme court comes to the conclusion no no information shall be given 
Yes, yes, Raj. The, the one, one point which we should also recognize is that the foundations of the right to information is about speaking truth to power. If the purpose is to seek truth in the in exercise of all power, then the question is not really about the fact that all kinds of information has to be put in the public domain. Because one of the major, you know, discussion which never happens is that all kinds of information just putting in the public domain and does not mean that there is going to be good governance. It is or also about the way, accountability. It's also about the mindset about institutions when it comes to information being shared. So you, one of the questions which is very important to ask is that even it's entirely possible and it, it's happening as we speak where many public authorities are pretty much not change their approach towards functioning or excess of power still Despite the simply RTI. giving away information. So let us also recognize that the mere giving away of information doesn't strengthen or improve the quality of governance. It also needs to be a change in the mindset and approach towards transparency. Yes, Anjali. Well, uh, I agree, but at the same time, I think Just the important... Just seeking information for the sake of seeking information. See, that is one of the, that has been one of the big, big debates Right from the beginning, as far as RTI is concerned, and this is not and only creating related problems and creating, you know, the lot of and this is not only related to, to the judiciary, uh, Girish. It, yes. So let me let me actually say that what Mr. Mr. Mishra said that unfortunately the way this particular case has panned out, it is really looking like they are ju they have become judges in their own cause, the Supreme Court. And I think that the point where we talk about appointments, even if we look at judicial pronouncements, in the case of the CVC, for example, Mr. P.J. Thomas, when the Supreme Court said, uh, you know, struck, struck down his appointment, the court said that there is utter and dire need for transparency in the process of appointments in all institutions. And the credibility of institutions is in, it's, it depends on the level of transparency with which people are appointed in these institutions. And I think that holds true in a democracy, even for the judiciary. Now, the point that we keep talking about in terms of, uh, you know, what information can be made available or should not be made available, the scope... The other important the thing right, is the misuse of the uh, whole, whole process. So the itself. misuse of the Right to Information Act... Uh, Girish, the Right to Information Act can only be used to access information that exists. It cannot be used to, to get information created. Information that exists, if it, it uh, reveals some wrongdoing, well, it reveals wrongdoing. It, you can't misuse an instrument like the Right to Information. You can, people say there's blackmail, but what can you blackmail somebody for if there is nothing to blackmail them about? But I think let's come to the point of defense also, that the judges have no defense. To my mind, if information is made available in the public domain, that would be the best defense because facts would speak for themselves. If there is a judge about whom there are wrong sorts of allegations that have been made, if information is in the public domain, then the people would in any case be able to see. So even without them having the opportunity to defend themselves, which is also a concern, I think Transparency would help resolve that problem as well. And in a democracy where the institution of the judiciary is so important, and it, it, it is true, it occupies a very, very central space, I think that the is issue of public trust is very important. Public pressure needs to be, I mean, when we look at the recent, uh, you know, the, uh, the statements of the CJI in terms of vacancies in the courts, now, this is really a way of creating public awareness about this important issue and also about creating public pressure. One of so the I things, think that one, it really one of the helps. Concerns, one of the concerns expressed or one of the questions actually which will be dealt by the Constitution bench is about, you know, if, if, this, is, if this becomes open, if this information is uh, in, available to the public, then maybe honest opinions may not be given by the by the concerned, uh, you know, whether it's the collegium or the government or wh whoever is involved. Well, this is an issue. Also. This is an issue that has come up with the bureaucracy, with the legislature across the board, and I so think it internationally, new, it is not. It is not. New, and we uh, believe that. It, it in fact helps people who want to do their jobs seriously and honestly when information is in the public domain because the facts are recorded, they are there for everybody to see. If there are any pressures, they are also there for everybody to see. So I think this honest opinions not getting recorded is something that we have heard from all sections okay. and in fact hasn't been borne out. Okay. And I just want yeah. to say that the right to information is a tool by which an institution becomes accountable to the citizens of a exactly. country. So that's important. Yes, Mr. Mishra. You know, you, for all jobs in India, all public jobs in India, 
every indian citizen has a right to be given a an opportunity to try for that job provided he meets the eligibility conditions no yeah there is no advertisement for the job for the post of judges in the high court or supreme court the people do not know who is to who is applying or not supreme court itself in the case of cic Whether anybody anybody applies or not uh, applies or not supreme court in the case of cic in two different orders have let down how the office of the cic should be filled by inviting applications from the citizens of india uh, it is applicable to all all public offices so in the case of supreme supreme court and high court nobody knows nobody. so so do we say that in the name of independence of judiciary everything 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 is uh, inaccessible to the public people public should not know so do just one sec i'll take one more sec i mean in every other branch of the state namely the executive and uh, legislature you will speak about corruption so do we deem that there is no judge who is corrupt how many how many judges have been really in the in the in the last 30 40 years how many judges ha have been impeached or uh, you know about what complaints have been filed i mean this would mean that all the judges are absolutely honest and there is nothing wrong in the judiciary i mean this would be very it it erodes the, the public trust the in the, the institution the judges the the, the higher higher judiciary itself doesn't believe that to be anyway. fair to the uh, see we also should understand let us also not assume there was a point about the fact that there's no advertisement there is no proper procedure you know we have proper procedure for appointment in the upsc state public service commission every job in the government is there by that proper procedure have we led to a situation where all these things are done honestly are in there corruption or is there isn't there institutionalized forms of corruption deeply embedded in every excess of power when institutions have policies procedures processes rules regulations selection process so in a way what i'm trying to say is let us recognize institutional integrity is much deeper than a process or procedure which you can put in place i absolutely don't believe that just by having advertisement and positions being put in people applying for it you can ensure integrity you okay. can have both sides okay that's a, that, that's a, that's a point uh, satprakash in, interestingly you know the, the the government and the judiciary has been has been at uh, you know loggerheads for some time now but on this issue the government and the supreme court seems to be on the same page i don't know whether the government has said because, anything because the, 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 the law the law minister the law minister the previous law minister had has been quoted as saying that you know they don't uh, they don't intend to bring judiciary or the appointment of judges under the rti act his statement does not carry any weight why because there is a law passed by parliament and law is applicable to judiciary and judiciary is a public authority within the meaning of section i suppose to h of but this uh, was this was the law minister previous law minister uh, his statement doesn't carry any weight because his statement is contrary to the uh, law enacted by parliament rti act does cover judiciary as an institution judiciary is a public authority within the meaning of rti act section 2 h i suppose so his statement notwithstanding judiciary is covered under rti and incidentally this case related to appointment of judges where the judiciary wants to maintain complete control and they don't want anybody else to know about the way they appoint judges this okay. relates to secrecy in appointment and this if you apply rti and particularly regarding uh, judicial appointments the process then uh, 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 judiciary they feel they are going to be exposed because i strongly believe the entire process is not transparent and there is something to hide for the judiciary okay uh, mr surab ji very quickly you think that now the now that the constitution bench will look into this matter can we hope for a early decision on this matter or as mr mr mishra you know is is mishra's concerns that it may just drag on no 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 question about it it's referred to the constitution bench and why should we assume there are many things to assume i don't like it they have something to hide <laughs> what to hide as i said that made this so the reasoning why they appointed a certain person okay on the basis of a judgment or basis of performance Okay. But there should be some limit. Do you want everything to be disclosed, every detail, every material? Okay. At least something should be disclosed. In okay. In this case, there was nothing disclosed. I don't disclosed. understand this. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. On that note, we need to end. But we'll, let us hope that the Constitution Bench will take note of all the uh, concerns raised here, and also how how they will look at this entire issue. We'll wait and watch. Thanks to all my guests. 
Please keep watching. We'll come back with Anandarish in the big picture same time.